This is the Jason Jones Show, powered by Mudhouse Media. Now, here's Jason Jones. Aloha, everybody, and welcome to the Jason Jones Show. I am your host, Jason Jones, broadcasting from the Lone Star State, the great state of Texas, and it is still over 100 degrees. And today I am I'm joined by another Texan, uh, John Zmirak. I know it's John is everyone's favorite guest, so I'm just going to get on with the interview. But before I do that, I want to let you know this episode is being brought to you by Epic Times. You need to get that digital and print subscription so you can stay informed, stay free, and get real news. The other media outlets are hiding from you. Go to iReadEpoch.com and use the code Jason Jones. And for a dollar a month, you can try this wonderful paper out. This episode is also being brought to you by MyPillow.com. Go to MyPillow.com, use the code Jones, and you will get deep discounts on all MyPillow products, but the lowest price ever on Mike Lindell's wonderful slippers. And of course, As always, this episode is being brought to you by the Vulnerable People Project, standing in solidarity with the vulnerable, from the child in the womb to children in Afghanistan and Pakistan uh, and safe houses that we're sheltering in Western Ukraine. What we do with the Vulnerable People Project is advocate for the vulnerable. Go to thegreatcampaign.org and stand with us as we stand with them. All right. John Zmirak from the stream coming up next on the Jason Jones Show. John Zmirak, welcome to the Jason Jones Show. Thanks, Jason. It's great to talk to you. It's been a while. Yeah, well, it's not been that long. We were talking, about last week, two weeks ago? I think it was two weeks ago. I mean, it feels like a long time because in the meantime, I took my first vacation in years. I took three whole days off work and added that to the 4th of July. <clears throat> and went to New York City to hang out with my best friend Anthony since best friend since second grade, and uh, his family were off in, in Paris at a family wedding. He wanted to stay home with the dog, so you see, he and I get along. <laughs> uh, so we went dogs, to yeah. we went to his house and just listened to Kiss records and ate fun Greek and Italian food for a week. It was awesome. The best advice my uh, a mentor of mine gave me was never do business with somebody who does not have old friends. And if, if yeah. you've got a friend that you have been listening to Kiss Records with since uh, 1976, that's a good sign. Yeah, yeah. We, we became friends in second grade and have stayed best friends ever since. You know, my, I, my best friend from those days, we, we met in the first grade. I went to all the bus stops in the neighborhood, declared that I was king, and uh, would fight anyone that dare challenge me. I had one bus stop left to go in our entire complex of townhouses and uh, declared, and I was going to be emperor. I'm six years old, and I'm planning to be emperor of bus stops, I guess. <laughs> and I really had it in my mind, in my six-year-old mind, I had to beat somebody up at every bus stop so I could rule over them. And uh-huh. uh, the last bus stop, and I would have, I would have, uh, I would have had my empire. And this kid, I said, that I'm the king of this bus stop. Who challenges me? And then, whap! He he hit me in the nose with his uh, lunch pail, and we've been best friends ever since. <laughs> he <laughs> saved you from being a, a lifelong Democrat. Really? Yeah, I could have. Yeah, you were basically building a political machine there in Chicago. <laughs> was, an urban, yeah, exactly. You could have be been Rahm Emanuel. It could be an alderman. Yeah, you could have been. You could have been Rahm Emanuel. <laughs> Barack Obama. I could have been Barry. <laughs> You you walk blacker than he did. He does. So, <laughs> so, so John Smirak, you you pitched me this article uh, the other day, and um, at first you said you want to you want to work with me on this, and you pitched me the idea, and I thought that's that's not a good idea at all, and then, <laughs> <laughs> and then you laid it out, and I thought, yeah, that is, you know what. I think that is a great idea. So share with the audience. We have an article up right now over at the stream.org. And, uh, and, and the title is kind of self provocative and self-explanatory. Don't clean pro abort graffiti off churches and pregnancy centers. In the wake 
of the Supreme Court finally deciding to read the Constitution, the words in the Constitution, and apply them rather than invent invisible words written in dis- disappearing ink between the lines. Um, Roe v. Wade and Casey v. Planned Parenthood have been overturned because they were badly decided. They were bad law. They were garbage law. I didn't hear you say that one more they- time. Roe v. Wade and Casey v. Planned Parenthood have been overturned. I heard you. I just wanted to hear you say that again. That sounds so good. Yeah, that sounds Uh, so good. They weren't just bad law. They were garbage law. They were like something that a sophomore who's a stoner at a fourth-rate law school and about to flunk out would make up for the essay exam on his way to go getting a job, going and getting a job at Office Depot. That's how bad they were. And... The way to know that is to read Samuel Alito's exquisite majority opinion in the Dobbs case. He he doesn't he doesn't demolish those opinions. He obliterates them the way antimatter obliterates matter and leaves nothing but a vacuum behind. And you'll notice <clears throat> since the uh, Dobbs ruling, not one liberal has come to the defense of the constitutional merits of either Roe or Planned Parenthood. Not either. one. Not one. They don't even attempt. They do not even attempt. They don't even they, try. It's as all if they, they, they can see that this was a lie that we should have just all accepted. Right. And so instead what they're doing is trying to assassinate Justice Kavanaugh, hounding him out of public restaurants, um, demonizing and using race, vicious racist language about Justice Thomas. It's interesting Nobody's attacking Gorsuch. Gorsuch voted the same way as Clarence Thomas, but he's a nice white Episcopalian, so nobody is making racial epithets about him. That's interesting. Yeah, that is interesting. I mean, I, I've seen leftist white influ- influencers, whatever that is, um, leftist white influencers dropping the N word and not getting called on it. Like Jill, you know, Taco, uh, Taco Jill. Breakfast taco. I'm going to, from now on, all the Mexicans I meet in Texas, I'm just going to call them breakfast tacos because that's apparently the politically correct term. Yeah. The, what they get away with is unbelievable. Uh, Hunt, <laughs> did, did you see the Hunt, not to digress, did you see the Hunter Biden videos this week? I've, I've seen uh, I've seen various, uh, as many clips of them as, as I could stomach. Um, he, he is quite the case. I mean, but let's not get off on that. I want to get back to the, to the road thing. All right. Uh, all right. We are seeing a wave of destructive violence, a national conspiracy of destructive violence against pro-life churches and against crisis pregnancy centers. Elizabeth Warren, a senator, has said that all crisis pregnancy centers need to be shut down. You may not offer help for a woman to, to carry on her pregnancy. You may not do it, not even with your own money. That's how fanatical the cult of human sacrifice for sexual convenience has become. It, when the Temple of Satan announced it was going to defend abortion as a religious ritual, at first people chuckled, but the Democrats did not reject them. They did not say, we don't want your help. They did not say, don't sign on as a friend of the court. No, they accepted their help. The Temple of Satan presenting abortion as a religious ritual, and the Democrats are fine with it. You know who else is fine with it? Pope Francis, who rebuked Archbishop Cor de Leon of San Francisco for denying communion to Nancy Pelosi. The same pope who went out of his way to condemn Donald Trump as a presidential candidate for talking about building a border wall. Because Pope Francis says you shouldn't politicize the gospel except when I decide to. Anyway, this wave of violence, dozens of churches and pro-life pregnancy centers had windows broken, graffiti written on them, uh, arson attempts. So in this article at the stream, you and I ask, what do we do about this? Well, obviously, we, we demand the protection of law. St. Paul demanded the protection of Roman citizenship when he was being persecuted. We demand that the Justice Department crack down on this national terrorist conspiracy, uh, which it refuses to condemn. The White House press secretary 
when when asked about Justice Kavanaugh, a Supreme Court justice, being hounded out of a restaurant by a mob, so he had to go out the, 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 the back door and hide. She said, well, that's democracy. Is, is that how you've ever heard democracy defined? Mobs attacking judges? I think that's how a narco tyranny works. But that's another another podcast. No, you you were the first to really on this show signal to me and to this audience that, that w- what we're dealing with is anarcho terrorists. And, and to your anarcho- point, I don't know if we talked about this. The New York Times had an article uh, in the wake of the opinion of the overturning of Roe v. Wade, and the article was expressing a horror that pro lifers have said they will use violence to defend themselves from acts of violence. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I, personally, I think citizens' militias with AR-15 should be outside churches and crisis pregnancy centers. But, you know, I don't want people going to jail. And in some states, the Second Amendment is still a dead letter, despite the recent support, Supreme Court decision. So um, I want well, I people to be my wife, out there. I taught my wife how to, to notice in our church how, where to look to see if, if men are armed. And uh, today she's like, there's so many guys packing in our parish i said yeah there sure is <laughs> show is so what i would suggest is to the the terrorists to just keep it in your own neighborhood you know if you're going to be a terrorist do it in blue cities and blue states and you'll be fine yeah the problem is though some of the most beautiful historic churches are in the old blue cities that's the only reason not to want god to bring on them the fate of sodom and gomorrah is that there are irreplaceable old buildings there that they're just not going to build that way again Think of all the Art Deco buildings in Detroit, right? <clears throat> so, you know, no. I have a mind for the for the buildings. No one speaks up for the old buildings. No one speaks for the buildings. No. So, John, well, when you first Except pitched, me. Except when me. You, <laughs> when you first pitched this idea for this story, uh, I thought of Giuliani's strategy in New York, which was to immediately fix anything that was broken. They broke a window in an abandoned building to fix the window. If they spray-painted graffiti on something, immediately cover it up. So I thought... If they're going to vandalize our pregnancy centers and our churches, we leave it there. We're going to see a spread of this type of destruction beyond our churches and beyond our pregnancy centers. Well, that that actually would be fine with me. Um, if they, I don't want only churches and pregnancy centers to be to be targeted, and and for the the for the abortion clinics and the shopping malls to be unscathed. You don't deserve order in the streets if you're going to have slaughter in the womb. Uh, and the thing about Giuliani is he was the government of New York. Okay, so it was a friendly government that actually wanted law and order. Imagine a government where only Jewish businesses get vandalized. And no. get their windows broken. Well, that's why I and thought about it. And the government's okay with that. No, when you and the government's it to me, okay with that. When you pitched it to me for that one second, I was like, yeah, that's not a good idea. And then I went through the Giuliani argument in my mind. And then I thought, you know what? No, it needs to spread. If it's not going to stop, if they're not going to protect us, if they're going to prosecute us for protecting ourselves, um, if they're going to smear us and dox us when we defend our churches, then let it spread. And that's then, right. Let the whole system come down, and and then we will deal with it when it you know when but it's. That, but that's not the central argument of our piece. The central no. argument of our piece is when Jesus Jesus we meditate on the wounds of Jesus, on on his on on the whipping the stripes he got from being flogged, on the wounds on his head from the crown of thorns. These are objects of Christian veneration, and in fact. St. Paul boasted only of the suffering he endured to, to, to spread the gospel. And, and we quote the, the relevant passage in Corinthians in the article. <clears throat> Depictions of the, early, of the martyrs of the, of the early church showed them suffering, showed the instruments that they were killed with or showed them in the process of being martyred. And on Easter, when our Lord arose, he still had the marks of his passion. That's a profound thing. You would have expected if this were some pagan myth. <coughs> Excuse me. Jesus to rise perfect, flawless, not a mark on him. That's what would happen in a Greek myth. Or he would come back glowing and, and burning and, and, and killing his enemies. No. What happened in the historic, all too real resurrection 
is Jesus still had the wounds in his hands and the wound in his side that Thomas could put his finger in. Christianity, we don't hide the price of redemption. We don't hide the, the price of the gospel, the cost of, the, of discipleship. If you stand with the vulnerable, with the scapegoats, and in our society, the unborn are the biggest scapegoats. They pay the price for our sexual convenience, for our individualist society, for our attempt to eliminate womanhood altogether and make everyone some variety of man. That, that's the ideology that we have. Uh, the arguments that Ruth Bader Ginsburg gave for keeping abortion legal, the primary one was women must be equally free from the results of sexual intercourse as men have always been in order to achieve equality. <clears throat> this argument comes from Simone de Beauvoir, the mother of second wave feminism, but it's not original to her. She and Jean-Paul Sartre were great admirers of the Marquis de Sade. The Marquis de Sade, who was a pervert who went to prison for torturing prostitutes he had kidnapped, the Marquis de Sade hated biological reproduction, hated the human body, hated human existence, and hated God for making us this way. And he urged in his book, Philosophy in the Bedroom, that abortion should be perfectly legal and was perfectly moral and was perfectly natural. He is the first thinker since the conversion of the Roman Empire to make an argument for legal abortion, ever. And Simone de Beauvoir picked it up. She wrote, actually wrote a book about how great the Marquis de Sade was called Must We Burn de Sade? She wrote a book praising Sade. She mainstreamed his arguments, and Ruth Bader Ginsburg picked them up. And they are the mainstream arguments for abortion, that women must be turned into men so they can walk away from sex just like men. The most fundamental difference between the sexes must be erased. So when pro, when there are some pro-abortion feminists who are upset by trans, the transgender thing, they think it's erasing women, they deserve it. They already erased women. When they embrace the Marquis de Sade's misogyny as, as channeled through second wave feminism. So in the article, we argue we should leave the graffiti on the buildings. Yeah, fix the broken windows. Anything that presents a hazard will fix. But leave the graffiti. Leave that hateful graffiti. Let the wounds of the passion that we are enduring with Christ, with the unborn, let those wounds be visible. Let people see where the violence is, who's committing the violence, and who is being the victim of violence. Let the violence be visible. It's not our job to clean up the crime scene for pro-abortion terrorists. It's not our job to, to cover up what they did. What they did needs to be seen the way the George Floyd video needed to be seen, the way this video of the cops doing nothing in Uvalde needed to be seen. Evil thrives in darkness and in doubt and in lies and deception and obfuscation. The truth comes with the light. Let people see that the people who claim they're advocates of women are torching buildings that give out diapers and baby shoes and baby clothes to poor, a lot of them non-white women, in crisis. And that the Democrats want to destroy that, to, get, to leave women with only the choice of surrendering their baby to Planned Parenthood so it can be cut up and its organs can be sold to the, C to the CDC. Its organs can be grafted onto mice and used in Frankenstein experiments by Dr. Fauci and Dr. Collins. Let people see that. Well, John, you mentioned that the truth. I believe the truth is coming out, right? You have the Church of Satan arguing that this would violate their religious freedom to dismember preborn children um you have these these slogans when again when you called me about the marquis de sad article i thought okay john this is good this is a leap john here we go again like when you would 10 years ago you were telling me about the catholic integralist i'm like okay john sees an illiberal behind every tree um but then i read your piece and the slogans are literally lifted from marquis de sad 
Yeah, from his pornographic novel. And remember, the Marquis de Sade was a fan of child molesting, incest, rape, torture, dismemberment. His books are unreadable by any normal person. I once opened one in a library and I got maybe seven, eight paragraphs in and I had to close it. The idea that Simone de Beauvoir read them all enthusiastically and wrote a book praising them should tell us that the, the, the roots of feminism, of, of second wave and third wave feminism, are very dark, um, verging on diabolical. Because no normal human being could read this stuff. I mean, I think they're it's diabolical. What? I don't know if you've seen. I don't think they're verging on diabolical. It's di. It's it's diabolical. Um, I'm yeah. I mean, I'm looking at the posts from the pro boards on Instagram and TikTok, and they're celebrating child murder. They're saying we know it's killing a baby. Peter Crave wrote a book, The Apple Argument Against Abortion, mm -hmm. and he said, if you agree an apple's an apple, I can walk you from that to acknowledging that abortion's wrong. And he, he, he wrote an article, I think it was an article, maybe it was a speech years later, where he, he talked about how after writing that book, he realized mm -hmm. he was a little disingenuous because that wasn't his experience as a teacher, as a professor. Mm -hmm. His experience was that when he convinced them that abortion killed a child, it didn't make them want to protect the child they just shrugged their shoulders and said, well, okay, well, I'm then for killing children. Right. I mean, the Nazis told themselves that Jews weren't really human, but they knew better. That's why people who worked in concentration camps would have nervous breakdowns. They had to be cycled in and out. They couldn't st keep working there for more than a few months. They would become alcoholics, drug addicts. They would commit suicide. We have a speech by Heinrich Himmler. Uh, it's an infamous speech in Posen where he talked to the leaders of the Einsatzgruppen, who were the roving bands of Nazis who just shot Jews down in the streets in, in Ukraine and Russia. And he, he talked to them about the psychological burden of doing this necessary work and how it wasn't easy and you shouldn't take pleasure in it, but to be able to do it and remain a decent fellow, that was the true moral achievement of being a good Nazi. That's what we're dealing with now. People, the whole idea of bipartisanship and cooperation with people whose most important issue is killing innocent babies for sexual convenience. How can you trust these people on the border, on tariffs, on the budget? These people have committed themselves to the most profound evil, an evil which says that human existence is not a good thing, that which tells itself these children are better off dead because if they were born, they might grow up blue collar. Well, if you're a blue collar worker, maybe you should think that through, that the party which pretends to represent you thinks you'd be better off if you'd been aborted. Maybe Hispanics should think about this, and I think they are. Um, you have idiots like Bishop Seitz of, of, I think, Corpus Christi or Brownsville, Texas. He, he said that deporting an illegal immigrant is equivalent to abortion. What does that say? It says that Mexico or Honduras or whatever country they came from is a medical waste dumpster. Right. They well, might well, as well, well be aborted. Well, Mexico, um, when they deport uh, Guatemalans, is that the same as abortion? Or just when the United <laughs> States does it? Exactly. exactly. Well, by the way, is it like abortion when the Biden administration leaves American citizens at the hands of the Taliban? Is that like abortion? <laughs> now, of course, it's not fair to, to argue with left-wing Catholics because it's, it's like beating up the kids on the short bus because the Catholic left is just where really dumb leftists go to shine. People who couldn't compete in the secular left, who wouldn't get noticed anywhere else. In the Catholic left, they have their own little special Olympics where they can – you know, shine for the, for their 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 fellow losers. <laughs> I mean, Mark Shea couldn't write for the Nation. Mark Shea couldn't write for the Village Voice. Does Mark uh, Shea? Does he still write? That guy? Yeah, he's a Facebook user. He publishes on Facebook. He he posts about that. No, I, I remember I he reading. A, he he wrote a long post about ten years ago how he is a writer because he publishes on Facebook. Yeah, <laughs> he uh he he denounced. The end of Roe v. Wade. 
Now, Mark Shea is a case, Jason, where I can say I told you so. You, you thought he was well-meaning and confused. I did. And maybe a little stupid. You were right about stupid, but you were not right, right about well-meaning. <laughs> These people know what they're doing because this is spiritual warfare, and there are only two sides. And the line that divides them is not Catholic, Protestant, Catholic, Orthodox, Jewish, or Christian, or Muslim. The line that runs through the human heart that divides us in America is unborn children. That is, a, that is something even a decent atheist should understand is wrong. I don't want to have a meal with someone who favors legal abortion. I don't have pro-choice friends, not, a, not if I know about it. Uh, I don't want to be around those people. And, I, you know, I always used to get the abortion when I was dating. I would always get the abortion argument over with on the second by the second date. Uh, I would make my position clear. And if she got upset, I would lay out some arguments. And typically she would get more and more upset and then she would cry. And she looked at me because this was the test. If I cave in because she's crying, then maybe we can go out again. But. I didn't cave. I, I actually got more relentless and pressed the point home more aggressively. And you know what? I never had to waste another dollar on buying those people a meal again. Yeah. No, I'm with you. Saved me a lot of heartache. Right. It's too. unbelievable. What? It, what? Well, reading Gerard and, and looking at the different enthusiasms of violence, of accepted violence through the ages, I just I just look at them as just poor souls swept away by the spirit of the age. They're not exceptionally evil, but they're just not good. They're just simpletons. They're just easily, they're, they conform to the spirit of the age. They would have been racist 50 years ago. They would have been defending slavery 150 years ago. Um, this, I, and, I, yeah, and, the and spirit of the years, age is just. In 100 years, they will, you know, they'll be the most adamant pro lifers because we're clearly moving towards a pro life culture. And, that's right. Uh, and, uh, Oh, go ahead. And that's why the left is so fanatical, because they know they have lost the argument on the merits. So now they're just using force. Now they're just using intimidation. It's like some third world dictatorship that has lost the support of the people. So it just ratchets it up with the secret police and the propaganda. But, I mean, I see the radicals being very violent. They are terrorists. They should be treated as terrorists. They should be sent to Gitmo and waterboarded, and we should never hear from them again. I mean. <laughs> that's what yeah. I think. But um yeah. but I see most on the left kind of quietly slinking away from the issue. Am I, are you noticing that? No, I'm not noticing that. Uh I'm I'm seeing them double down and triple down. Um I'm I'm seeing I you know, I think we're at the point in our national exorcism where the demon stops engaging in in sophistic arguments and just tries to strangle the priest and spews green vomit all over the room and throws the poor possessed body all over the place. Uh, I'd be delighted no, I see a lot see. of that. I see these, 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 you know, the libs of tip TikTok is one of my favorite Instagram pages. Yeah. And you just, you can watch them having breakdowns over and over and over again all day eating popcorn. And it's quite pleasant, but, um, but I just notice. Even even the Biden administration came out and said some pro choicers are pro choice activists are out of touch with the American electorate. Do you think they're catching on that they're about to scare away the youth, Latinos? I don't think so. Because I don't think so. The president just issued an executive order that they're going to do abortions on Indian reservations and federal army bases and federal land inside pro life states. There are pro aborts. They're they're planning to do a boat that will sail off the coast of pro life states and do abortions. I think we should build a submarine and get ready to take care of it. <laughs> I know. I, when I saw that, I, I tweeted out calling all pro-life Navy SEALs and pirates. <laughs> Maybe what we can do is we can capture it and then sail it to pro-abortion states to um, offer, you know, free baby formula and diapers because they're blowing up those pregnancy centers and making them illegal anyways. Massachusetts. And then, is, the, U then the U.S. Navy would get involved and, and sink it. Yeah, but, but yeah, if, if you that's a good idea. So if we sailed a pro life pregnancy center off the shores of Massachusetts, we would be shot down. Yeah, we would be sunk. Yeah, we'd be sunk. But they, we need they to make sure we have children. video. Right, they can slaughter right. children off the coast of Texas. Yeah, I just think I maybe I'm naive, but I'm really hopeful when I see how I look at the youth activists. I 
and I, and I, and I don't mean this to be cruel. I'm, I'm saying this sincerely. When I go to these events and I see the Antifa folks and the others, they all truly appear to me to be struggling with intellectual disabilities of all different kinds. And I'm saying that quite sincerely. Yeah. They seem to they seem just they're they're dealing with things. They're not they're, they're there's not as like if but if you look at the young pro life activists, how well formed they are, how educated they are, how professionally they are, how shameless and aggressive they are, fearless. Um, I just don't see how the left stands a chance on abortion. And I even see the eruption of the pro life left. So I think the next 10 years are going to be quite interesting. I certainly hope so. I think if you want to understand what's happening with America now, from the abortion movement to the transgender movement to the LGBTQ, my name is Legion movement, you need to read the novel by Dostoevsky, The Possessed. It's also translated The Devils. And in it, you see see the these characters, they go from wanting to reform the czarist system and get rid of serfdom to total nihilism and wanting to destroy everything, destroy everything in the hope that from the rubble, something good will emerge. The left is trying to destroy everything. The sovereign nation state, they're destroying borders, they're destroying farmers, they're trying to destroy the family, they're trying to destroy parenthood, they've, they've destroyed schools, they're destroying churches. They don't build anything, anything at all, except maybe gay bars where you can spread monkeypox. Yeah, I, d- I doubt they even build those. Those are probably some conservative gay guys. Yeah, right. <laughs> the, 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 I meet these guys, they're like, don't tell anyone I'm Republican. Oh, they're in the closet about being Republican. Yeah, don't tell <laughs> don't, no, I get that. I get that all the time. I have so many closet Republican friends. That Jason, just don't tell me. I just, I so think, I'm so grateful for what you do, but uh, I can't tell anybody. <laughs> I, I, honestly, it's hysterical. I'll cut a lot of slack to some to someone, regardless of his sexual peccadilloes, if he's pro-life. To me, that is like the mark of election, of the mark of hope. Someone who's pro-abortion, I do not treasure hope for their eternal salvation. I, uh, I mean, I could be there. wrong. I could be wrong, but I, I don't even worry about it. Um, you know, they're you know, not even I, happy. Have you noticed, I've had friends, for whatever reason, <laughs> not a lot, but a few. Well, I mean, I can tell you the reasons probably, but I'm, I'm not going to speculate. But I've had a few friends that have gone from pro-life to pro, quote-unquote, choice, pro-abortion. And in doing so, I watch as their lives unravel. They become dark and lonely and miserable people. It's like the first step towards um, a night, they just oblivion. They just, their lives become wastelands. And then I've seen the other, where I've seen friends who are rapidly pro-abortion become pro-life. And I've watched as their life has flourished and how beautiful their life has become. It's like the, the you know, their life is their own reward. If if you accept the premise that human beings are worthless and you could be violent to the weak, you're lost. Right, right. Yeah, I mean that is. It's a fundamental negation of of life itself. The purest the purest test of whether you think human life is good is whether you think innocent babies who've done nothing wrong should receive the death penalty because they get in the way. And, and I think it becomes even clearer when we think about handicapped unborn babies, like Down syndrome. 98% of Down syndrome children in Iceland are aborted. Iceland is bragging that it will cure Down syndrome by killing everyone who suffers from it. Uh, a child with Down syndrome is, is, is so innocent. He's probably incapable of a mortal sin. That kid is headed for heaven. And virtually all of them report being happy and enjoying their lives. Their parents report being happy and enjoying having them for as long as they have them because a lot of them have serious medical issues. Um, I'd actually like to – did I – have we spoken yet about the movie about Charles de Gaulle? Uh, Not not on the air, I don't think, but you doubt – you no, you did because – People have told me they've watched it because you recommended it, but I have not watched it yet. Confess. You should watch it. The Life of Charles de Gaulle, and I'll just reiterate one point. His, the person he loved the most in the world was his daughter, Anne, who had Down syndrome. And she was the light of Charles de Gaulle's life. 
And one of his inspirations in fighting the Nazis, because the Nazis weren't just killing Frenchmen in battle, they were massacring children with Down syndrome in German hospitals. And on my trip, to, I went, made a trip to Vienna to look at all the old Habsburg palaces, and I went to see this exquisite church, the Steinhof, was built by Otto Wagner, and it's that 1914 style of architecture, sort of halfway between Art Deco and Art Nouveau. It's just exquisite. It's this beautiful church. But what I didn't realize before I went there was it is the chapel of a mental asylum. The mental asylum for the city of Vienna is now known, is now named Otto Wagner Hospital after the architect who built their chapel. And as part of that hospital, there was a, there was a, a section called the Spiegelgrund. And what the it was built when Austria was a Christian monarchy. It was built as a rehabilitation and 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 you know skill center for handicapped children. When the Nazis took it over, they turned it into a killing center for their euthanasia program. And the doctor in charge, he would kill the he, children like if they had a, a hair a cleft palate or a hair lip or if they wet the bed would be sent there and would be killed and he would take out their brains and experiment on their brains. And he had dozens of their brains in jars at the end of the war. So what was a Christian rehabilitation hospital is now a Holocaust memorial site at the site of this exquisite church. I, I, I thought I was just going to see a beautiful church. I didn't know I was going to have a profound confrontation with the Holocaust, but there you go. Yeah, and those. Uh, I wrote about that. I have an essay about that called "Praying with the Kaisers." If anybody wants to Google it. Well, yeah, send it to me, and I'll put it in the show notes. Okay, great. I'll put it in the show notes. So, John, uh, before I let you go, I know you're um, you're working on a new article. Can we? Do you want to talk about that now, or do you want to save it? Um, let's 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 save it for next time. We have part one up already. The demonic origins of Planned Parenthood. Part one is about how Planned Parenthood originated with Margaret Sanger creating a kind of a Darwinian sex cult that, that combined scientific racism and eugenics with a bizarre new agey mysticism that if we unleashed the power of sexuality, if we got, if we shed our sexual inhibitions, human beings would become a super race and live like gods on the earth and create an earthly paradise that we wouldn't need to think about illusions like God and heaven. That is all open on a historical record. You can read about it in Margaret Sanger's book, The Pivot of Civilization. She sounds like a, a mixture of Hugh Hefner, the Marquis de Sade, and Ralph Waldo Emerson, all sort of blended together in some disgusting shake. But there's actually more to it I'm writing part two, today, <clears throat> part two today, which will be up soon at, the, at stream.org, uh, about the explicitly demonic and occult practices that Sanger was engaged in that connect the origin of the abortion movement directly to dark, preternatural spirits. Yeah, I don't think we're too far away from Planned Parenthood publicly jettisoning any connection with Margaret Sanger, right? I mean, it's it's become generally and widely known that she was a racist. They renamed, they took her name off the clinic she founded in, in Greenwich Village, and it, it no, the city took down the sign, it's no longer Margaret Sanger Place. Ah. I mean, she, she just spoke at one too many Klan rallies to uh, avoid being canceled. And I'm sure it was very painful for them to cancel her. I'm sure it was. Now, I want to remind people, you and I did a piece several years ago. The title was, One of Margaret Sanger's Pals Ran a Concentration Camp That Killed Black People. And that's true. Margaret Sanger worked closely with the leading eugenics advocate in, in Germany who had run a concentration camp in the German colony of Cameroon during World War I where they murdered blacks and he cut open their skulls and experimented on them. He went on to be a close collaborator with Margaret Sanger. She published his essays in the Birth Control Review. She had him speak at her conferences while, and this is in the 30s, while Hitler was implementing his program of eugenics. This is the guy 
whose book Hitler said he read in prison that made him a eugenicist. And uh, indeed, Margaret Sanger's number no, right-hand man, Harry Laughlin, was invited to Germany by the Nazis and did a whirlwind tour and got all sorts of Nazi awards because Planned Parenthood's eugenics program that was implemented in 13 American states and sterilized 60,000 Americans against their will, the, 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 the American Planned Parenthood eugenics program was adopted by the Nazis. The Nazi program was influenced directly by the American program. And if you want to know more about that, find the video MAFA 21, M W A F A, MAFA 21 Black Genocide. It's on YouTube. Uh, it's by, what's the name? Mark Crutcher? Mark, Mark, Mark Crutcher is a pioneer. I'm going to get him on these 49 days in a row. So much. He was the first one to really bring out the racist, to really break through and and communicate broadly the, the racist origins of Planned Parenthood. And not just with MAFA. In the early 2000s, maybe the 90s, late 90s, he had a website called ClanParenthood.com that, <laughs> that highlighted um, the, Margaret Sanger's involvement with the Klan and, and racist eugenicists. And it's, you know, it's for people to understand, being a racist and a eugenicist was palatable uh, as gender ideology is today. Race oh, ideology yeah, yeah. was, as, and I, I call it what we're dealing with now is it's, it's, it's fascism, but instead of rooted in made up race ideology, it's ra made up gender ideology. But uh, Margaret, Sanger used, Margaret Sanger used scientific racism as a fig leaf for her real agenda, which was total sexual libertinism. I mean, she believed in eugenics, but it wasn't really what she cared about. She cared about people unleashing their sexual energy so they could become God. And Superman. And that is clear from her book, The Pivot, Pivot of Civilization. And these are elite, and this is why they were eugenicists, because this is something only the elite could benefit from. If, if the That's right. poor behaved this way, well, then it would, she said that the weeds would strangle the strong Nordic oak. You couldn't have uh, right. the, uh, I guess, the vermin running around fornicating whenever they wanted with whoever they wanted. That's, yeah. that's just something for Hunter Biden and his friends. That's right. Our that's elite. right. Yeah. I mean, well, yeah. I mean, Hunter Biden smoked the same crack that sent thousands of young black men to prison thanks to Joe Biden's crime bill. Can't improve on that. I, I'm, a, I'm a satirical writer, I throw up my hands. I give up. I surrender. Whoever's writing this timeline has, has surpassed me. I give up. I can't do satire anymore because you know what? It's actually dangerous to do satire. Um, I want to close with this. In March 2020, when COVID was first hit, hitting us, I wrote a, a piece about Drag Queen Story Hour. Drag Queen Story Hours are clearly intended to encourage transgender confusion among small, vulnerable children. That's their goal. The goal is to spread sexual confusion, to spread the mental illness of gender dysphoria by contact, to spread it to children. I wrote about this thing just as insane as bringing COVID patients into nursing homes. You have COVID, COVID nursing home COVID story hour. Two weeks later, Andrew Cuomo and every other major blue state governor starts flooding nursing homes with COVID patients. I think they read my article and thought it was a policy suggestion. And so I feel maybe some responsibility for that. No, yeah, I think they're taking notes. You can't, um, by yeah. the way, I'm having the Babylon Bees creators just uh, reached out to us through their publicist to come on the Jason Jones show. So those are, uh, you know, you were the only person I've envied, um, and then these guys came along, and I, I quite envy them as well. <laughs> they're, they're funny. I, every time I'm like, why can't I be that funny? These guys are really funny. Um, but <laughs> there's that 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 Instagram, Twitter account, not the B, where it seems like a Babylon B headline. And now sometimes That's you read true. the Babylon B headlines, and I'm kind of confused because I'm like, wait, wait, that was a breaking news story yesterday, something just like that. It That's is. right. Hunter Biden. Hunter Biden is like something Andrew Breitbart would have made up after having too many bourbons. 
Look, Hunter Biden this week was committing the sin of own and walking down a beach naked with, except wearing a Ronald Reagan jacket. <laughs> Wait, that happened this week? This week. Well, so this is the story. I'm going to get Jack Maxey on the show to talk <laughs> about this. The I story love Jack. is He's an American hero. You know, he is. So, Jack, the story goes that the, his Hunter's iCloud was hacked. Um, but somebody was listening to Jack Maxey on Telegram or a podcast yesterday, and they, they sent me a ping that Jack said, no, this was actually the website, the, the um, laptop that came into his possession. And then and <laughs> a tech that worked for him uh, went to Switzerland and then without Jack's knowledge, just, just released everything. <laughs> and uh, Jack said, you know, he's been working on doing it, what he calls the right way. And this is just, I'm, this is the game of telephone. A friend told me, listened to it on Telegram and told me, he said that Jack said that uh, he is trying to get deputized by any sheriff in the United States so that they can go through it together and then send it to Interpol so that Hunter Biden can never leave the United States because clearly this DOJ isn't going to do anything about it. But I mean, the, the videos are utterly unbelievable. There's one that came out last week of a prostitute, a Russian prostitute fearing for her life, cowering in the corner. And he's like, what? Show me the bruise. I didn't hit you. I didn't hit you. Show me the bruise. I finally gave you the money that you asked for. Well, who are you talking to? And, um, and then, you know, this week he is literally walking down the beach filming himself while committing the sin of Onan um, and uh, wearing a Ronald Reagan jacket. Quite interesting. <laughs> and this isn't a news story. John, if you did that, it would be a huge news story. If John Zmirak was in a hotel with a Russian prostitute hiding for fear, fearing John, and, and you were saying, look, I gave you the money, that would be a national news story. Yeah. But not Hunter. You know, I, I almost feel bad. I feel like the secret committee formerly known as Joe Biden, <laughs> the deep state actors who are actually running the country, have decided to throw Sleepy Joe under the bus. That's what I think they've happening. decided. Yeah. They've decided that Camel A. Harris, the mean lady from the Department of Motor Vehicles, is going to be our next president. Um, and that might even be worse. So the fact that the Democrats want to get rid of Biden makes me want to cling to him and, and hold on to the venerable tradition of, of our 150-year-old President Grandpa Simpson. Yeah, I think you're right. I think we should start a super PAC defending poor old Sleepy Joe. I mean, look. Four more, six more years. Could you six imagine if Eric Trump was walking down the beach naked except wearing a Bill Clinton jacket? Yeah. Uh, or measuring. Another one was he's measuring co crack cocaine. Uh, <laughs> somebody on Instagram took that video with him weighing crack cocaine, debating how much it was weighing, haggling, haggling over the price of crack um, while um, they, they spliced it while his dad was giving a speech on how he's going to throw the book at anyone who sells crack, how there's no parole, no probation, nothing. You will serve every minute you sentenced to. And, you know, uh, yet, yet yeah. there's there's no consequences. It's just absolutely unbelievable. But then there's Jack Well, this Maxson. is what a narco-tyranny is. A narco-tyranny is anarchy for me, tyranny for thee. I can do whatever the hell I want because I live in the hacienda. You are subject to the most micromanaging law, laws and regulations because you live out in the favela. And that is what the, the our elites are currently engaged in. Their real ideology isn't even abortion. It isn't even the gay agenda. It isn't even Marxism. It is, we live in a hacienda, you live in the favela. We have absolute privilege, you have no rights. It, that's, it's come down to that. There's a great book um, called The Stakes by Michael Anton, uh, the former speechwriter for Trump who wrote the, the Flight 93 election essay. And his book, the book goes in detail into how the left is trying to create a pyramid society where all the money and power and all the legal rights are all concentrated in the 1% at the top. They throw, they throw bread and circuses to the mobs at the bottom that are their street muscle, like the rioters, um, and everybody in between gets squeezed. And that's what's really happening. That's why these elites love Cuba. They go to Cuba and they come back and they say, oh, Cuba is the greatest country on earth. Yeah. 
Because that's what yeah, they want. The, prostitutes, the hookers are cheap. The drugs are cheap. And I can do whatever you I want. You can pay off the police. And, if, if, you, if you torture yeah. and kill the prostitutes, you can pay off the police and don't have to worry about it. That's right. That's right. All right, Jason. Well, I've got myself good and depressed. I'm going to go, I'm just going to go watch Star Trek. Uh- <laughs> All right. You go to, if you want to get your, I, I just watched uh, the terminal list. I binge watched the terminal list. Okay. What's that? It's written by Jack Carr. He's a former Navy SEAL. And uh, it's kind of like, uh, if you read between the lines, I just bought the book. It's a series. It's about a disgruntled Navy SEAL that's, um, upset at how his other seals and the communities that we said we were going to help in the war on terror have been treated by the elite and wages a war on the elite. Wow. Okay. Yeah. The, 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 the ministerial list, the what? Uh, the terminal list, the terminal, the terminal list. list. I will look for it. Yeah. Look for that. All right. Thanks. Jason. All right, John. We'll talk thanks again for coming soon. on the show. Bye bye. All right, everyone. That was the great John Zmirak. You can follow him over at the stream.org. Most of you do. I mean, he's the most requested guest. He's on the most. I founded this podcast to exploit my friendship with him. And uh, if you go over there to the stream.org, you can, he is prolific. He's writing five articles a week. Uh, John and I are are preparing to um, re-release our book, The Race to Save Our Century. Hopefully that'll be coming out a new edition this fall. So much of what we anticipated in our book that happened has already happened. Um. And so we're updating the book and uh, adding a few chapters, adding a new introduction and a preface, and it'll be republished this this summer. But anyways, go or this fall, hopefully. Uh, go to the stream network, follow John. John, this episode has been brought to you by MyPillow.com. Use the code Jones for deep discounts. Go to iReadEpoch.com. Use Jason Jones. Get the digital and print subscription. And are you not a monthly donor yet to the Vulnerable People Project? You need to be because we are white knuckled. Um, we are overwhelmed um, with requests for help. We are building out our work in, uh, of course, in Afghanistan as other groups have retreated, just overwhelmed with the cost and the burden and how long it's been. Uh, those folks have fallen to us. We are trying to reorganize and we are trying to support everyone that's on our list and all the folks that have been dropped by other organizations. Those other organizations are heartbroken about it. Um, it's been a long time. They didn't expect the United States government to sit on its hands and watch SIVs, SIVs uh, be hunted uh, for a year without moving to resettle them. But we are not quitting, but we need your help. Go to thegreatcampaign.org and become a monthly donor. All right, until next time. By next time, I mean tomorrow. Jason Jones Show. We're doing 49 days in a row on row. And tomorrow, we will be interviewing the great Victoria Robinson, who is uh, probably one of the most beautiful voices, profound voices in the pro-life movement, dealing with post-abortion trauma and post-abortion healing. All right? Until tomorrow, it's the Jason Jones Show. This has been the Jason Jones Show, powered by Mudhouse Media. Oh,